Now, I'm a rhinologist, and I try to be vaguely academic in my practice, but I think I fall up just about every day because that's, that's the way it is. And our evidence, frankly, as I'll, go, I'll touch on, is truly appalling. Now, this is what I spend much of my day doing, is, is looking up noses and seeing what's up there. And they are the most absolutely magnificent repository of the most fascinating pathology you could ever imagine. And, and it's, this, it's this wonderful, like, it's this interface between us and you know, the, the real, it hits there first. And I, I just absolutely love it. Now this is something, in reality, I don't see many of these. This is a normal nose. And you can see we're in the right side, inferior turbinate, middle turbinate. It's actually, it's got a little posterior accessory osteum. And right at the back you can see the nasopharynx. And if you do that every day, it's just like doing um, ear exams with a little otoscope. Um, which I must confess I do all with the endoscope. If any of you have got an endoscope, endoscopes up the ears are amazing. When all of a sudden you think, ah, that's how you diagnose ear disease. You pop an endoscope up there. That's chronic rhinus sinusitis. And that's why people get really upset with it and because they're snotty all the time and they feel congested and because they have an, a mucosal inflammation releasing all of those neurocytokines they feel miserable they feel tired and they, you know the really good bit in your life is in between 90 percent and 100 percent if you're getting along at 90 percent you just get through your day and all of these guys are i think quite a bit less than that and here's a guy who has nasal polyps and about, I don't know, maybe about 20 or 30 percent of patients who have got chronic sinusitis have got nasal polyps. This is a particularly florid. Um, and that's just really, really, really swollen um, sinonasal mucosa. Does it make you miserable? Yes. Um, that's chronic rhinus sinusitis. This is, this SF 6D is, it, it's a questionnaire which you fill out and it basically, for, it doesn't matter what disease you've got, it, it's a generic thing for how miserable it makes you. Now, chronic sinusitis nestles in between end-stage renal failure and your first year of having Parkinson's, none of which are fabulous. Um, where's Obesity, COPD, moderate hearing loss, piece of cake compared to having sinusitis. HIV is worse, so so is being dead. Um, <laughs> so you know the patients are miserable. That's why they keep coming back to you. Um, they because it doesn't kill them, and if you don't help them, they sort of go. Well, I go to him, and he gives me a bit more flexinase and pats me on the back. They will eventually stop, and you think, well, that's gone but they remain miserable in reality. Does it affect their work efficacy? It affects young people, and this is one of the sort of satisfying thing, I think, about looking after um, sinusitis. It's a disease of young adulthood and middle age, uh, primarily. And that's the cost of refractory chronic rhinus sinusitis in the US compared, you can see asthma, migraine, heart disease and diabetes are all cheap by comparison. So is it worthwhile treating properly? Yeah, I think so. So anyhow, this talk is going to be on uh, how to structure the nose. And we're massively behind time. We've got plenty of time. Good, we, we do, we do. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, that's uh, I think the nice thing, because we're just going to have, we can just, just talk yeah. all the way through. Yeah. How to structure an approach to a block and snotty nose. What causes chronic rhinus sinusitis, which is what um, I think about a lot. Um, how you treat it, and uh, what's the role of surgery. So, what happens when somebody comes to you with a blocked or snotty nose? They will come to you with one which is acute, which is what Bruce has just been talking about, or one which is chronically blocked and snotty. So if it is acute, most of them are going to have acute viral rhinitis, which is rhinovirus or uh, coronavirus or whatever. Some of them will go on and form acute sinusitis, which is generally regarded to be an acute bacterial infection of the sinuses. And the sinuses are the little 
um, bony pockets with very small orifices. And so what happens, I think, the pathogenesis is the, nas the ostia occlude because of uh, thickening of the mucosa. There is an alteration because of the obstruction of the microflora and then there is this bacterial superinfection of the obstructed sinus ostia, which begs the question, why the devil do we have them? I think I know the answer. Well, this is what I've read. There are millions, well, dozens, of theories, none of which hold any water, like it makes your skull lighter and it improves your residence and, you know, good Lord, none of that makes any sense at all. The reason why there is evolutionary pressure to have sinuses is because if you don't have sinuses, you don't have a thin lamina papyracea. You know the, the, the medial wall of the orbit is the lamina papyracea and the inferior wall because of the maxillary sinus of the orbit is very thin. If you, if you didn't have sinuses, that, that, those would be solid blocks of bone, which when you were uh, tussling with the saber-toothed tiger and you got a pore in the eye, you're, you'd split your globe because it can't decompress. And we've got, we, you know, we have sinuses, so I've got thin, thin lamina. And, and the, the number of patients who we see who have had CT sinuses, and you see the little decompression fracture because the, the poor old sinus, remain, the, the lamina remains prolapsed into the nose and you can get caught out with sinus surgery because quite a lot of the eye can actually be in the nose. And these are all, so all injuries at the bottom of a ruck. Squash balls, for example, and there, a, a lot of us would have monocular vision over the, you know, the millennia. So when you throw your spear at the saber-toothed tiger because you don't have monocular vision, you miss and then he gets you and that's the end of your genes. So from, from an evolutionary point of view, that's, you know, of all of the theories I've read, that's the only one that holds any water. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, acute sinusitis. Now, acute sinusitis is an abscess. These guys have got pus. That's pus. That's not, that, you know, that's pus, isn't it? And that's actually from a, 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 another, it's another child, but a child who presented with this. It's acute sinusitis. Mm -hmm acute usually ethmoiditis, which then gets through the lamina papyracea, which is a little bit leakier in children than it is in adults. This is a very, very rare complication in adults. And that's got into her orbit. It, it's usually contained by the orbital periosteum, which is called the periorbiter, which is really quite tough and leathery. leathery. So the bugs go through the lamina papyracea and then form a little abscess under the periorbiter. Sometimes they get into the fat of the orbit and cause orbital cellulitis, and then the kids are really sick. The pressure increases because of the swelling, and these kids can lose their vision. They lose red vision first, for what it's worth, but if there's any change in vision, then if they're like this, if kids who have got sinusitis, got a red eye, go to hospital, and they get intravenous antibiotics. Most of them get better very quickly. If they don't get better very quickly, they get a CT scan and get taken to theatre. If they present to hospital and they have a vision problem, they get taken to theatre immediately. Rare, fortunately. But most of you have seen one or two? Yeah, they, they, they pop up. Anyhow, that's, that's the deal with those. They all go to your local um, children's paediatric uh, emergency. So, or they can present with chronic problems. And they can either have chronic rhinitis, which you know, we all know is hay fever, or sinusitis. So here's a normal nose, here's a CT scan of somebody with a normal nose. Everything is pristine, it is simple. Here is somebody with chronic rhinitis, and this is an important distinction, and the important distinction simply is you can see the turbinates are huge, and you know, that, that's, what, that's why they're miserable, because their turbinates look like that, and they can't breathe around those, and they're snotty all the time. They can't sleep at night. So, here's an interesting aside, in fact, about allergic rhinitis. Now, this is a guy who did the first description of allergic rhinitis in the English literature. And he was a liverpudlian, 
but he worked in London. And he wrote this, I think it was in 1819, so a devil of a long time ago. Now, it's exquisitely written and very insightful because he was describing his own case. Now, he was really <coughs> busy in London. He was passionately interested in hay fever, and it took him 10 years to find another 29 cases. In pre-industrial England, hay <coughs> fever was vanishingly rare. Ha! Or well, 28 cases. All right. <coughs> now, here's the deal. This is really fascinating. This is what has happened to the prevalence of allergic conditions in the world. And these are the countries in which we've got longitudinal data. They were uncommon conditions until the 1950s. Good Lord. They remain uncommon in rural South Africa. Everywhere else, you can Switzerland's at the top there, uh, former Eastern European countries, you can see they had relatively mm. low until they suddenly whizzed up. What happened in the 1950s? Got antibiotics. Yeah. Um, what happens to how? What, what, every mucosal surface we have is covered in a biofilm. It's got a whole microbiome, it's got a whole community. Everyone's got a slightly different community. You get your community initially from mum and dad, or actually mostly initially from mum, then a bit from dad. And then it changes, and it alters your mucosal immunity all the time. You've got inflammatory cells in your mucosa when you're healthy. What's it responding to? Having bugs on the surface. Does changing the bugs change the prevalence of atopic illness? Well, um, it's quite compelling, isn't it? What the hell else happened in 1950? You don't think it's just a measurement thing, do you? People were bothering to measure these things prior to that? I don't know. Everyone who's ever looked at it seems to think this is a way. Mm. Jonathan Bostock couldn't find it. No, you'd find 28 cases in about five minutes in our practice. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I look, I, 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 I suspect we are doing stuff. And our diets have changed, we've all got, we're different um, than we were, admittedly, we eat differently. Uh, we are uh, healthier, um, and it may well be that because we're not fighting off quite so many horrible bugs, there's much more vaccination. You know, there are other causes and they are contributing. I have a feeling that a bit of that is being driven by um, antibiotics. So, chronic rhinosinusitis, that's the case. That's what it looks like. That's with nasal polyposis. So you can see there's not much air in there. That's a miserable condition. These people really do feel awful. How do you diagnose it? Well, nose, nasal history is great because noses can only do five things because they can block and they can run and from the front or the back. Um, they can cause headaches and, or pain or pressure. I'll talk to at that point because that's quite an interesting point. You can see this patient's really congested and snotty, can't smell a thing, but isn't really sore. What have they got? They've probably got sinusitis. If it's the other way around and they've got a terrible headache, ah, uh, it's my sinuses. And you say, are you snotty and congested? And if they say no, they probably haven't. That situation there where they clearly have frontal sinusitis is a relatively uncommon cause of headaches. What causes headaches? Neurological stuff. Tension headaches. Migraines are difficult to diagnose. Do they need to be unilateral? No. Uh, there are lots and lots of patients who primarily their migraine is felt retroorbitally or in their mid-face. Is it reasonable they think it's their sinuses? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Does prednisone make everything better? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Temporomandibular joint syndrome. Uh, you know, how much of that do we see? Heaps. 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 Not everyone grinds, a lot of people just clench. Do you grind your teeth? Well, I don't think so. My partner never says I do. Um, 
a lot of people that uh, 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 they aren't doing that. Uh, they're doing that, and and it causes discomfort, and the discomfort radiates often anteriorly to the maxilla. So they think they've got sinusitis. Not at all uncommon. So what can you do? Um, can I encourage you to look? Because noses, I think, are frankly, it's the most interesting part of the body, bar none. And if you start looking at them, you'll recognise that there's just that they're totally, 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 much more interesting than ears, aren't they? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, thanks, so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Get out more, Anyhow. You can do a big speculum on your otoscope and you can see all sorts of stuff up in those. Um, you know unified airways. Unified airways really exist and one of the nice things about being a rhinologist is to make a lot of asthma a lot better. Uh, asthmatics who have got rhinitis and cannot breathe through their nose have their asthma worse. And when you fix their nose, their asthma gets a lot better. A lot of patients who have got a cough which is nocturnal and for goodness sake, it is in fact their sinusitis that gets cured if their sinusitis is fixed. So that's just something to bear in mind. Your brittle asthmatics, your difficult asthmatics, rather than giving them a whole ton of stuff for their chest or extra stuff for their chest, think about their nose. Look at their nose. And they've all got rhinitis. If you have asthma, you have rhinitis. If you have rhinitis, you don't necessarily need to have asthma. That's an interesting thing. It's because, actually, whoops. <laughs> ha. Time for an aside. No, I, I was going to tell you about rainstorm asthma oh, yes. in Melbourne. I've just been to Melbourne. One of my fellows got married, Ravi's wedding. And um, they, uh, asthma kills people over there when they get the rains. You know they have the cool change in Melbourne? Why do you reckon that is? What's the immunology of that? Because it's fascinating. Is it the dust or coming out? Is it dust or rain? Or, or the pollen? Yes. <laughs> now, the deal with pollen is pollen's big. And you have to, you the devil of a job to get pollen into your lungs because it sticks to all your nasal mucosa, which is why it gives you hay fever and you don't really. Who has seasonal allergic asthma? You know, not very many. You know, they, some people find it's a little bit worse, but they're not, you know, they're not, they don't come to you, oh, my God, I've got hay fever in my lungs. Mm -hmm because all the pollen's in their nose. But what the problem is with, with s storm cloud related asthma is that northern uh, uh, um, fields of uh, grasslands of Victoria, which are vast, the north wind comes down, which is why they have the, the, uh, the hot weather, air's full of grass pollen. Then they have the cool change, weather from the south, really heavy thunderstorms, and it pulverizes and aerosolizes the, the, the pollen, makes the, the pollen respirable. And so all of these people have still got IgE to pollen in their lungs, but they never see it. They get a whole lot of pollen in their lungs. And apparently for the guys who work in A&E, it's a nightmare. The, the, the city is gridlocked. You can't get an ambulance, so you just keel over at home. But anyhow, that's the, that's the immunology of that, which I think is interesting. Um, but that is a really, the, 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 the issue there is, is that there are lots and lots and lots of your difficult asthmatics who would do better if they had uh, a more focus on their nose. 